Uh, now it's not moving. There we go. Um, Kristen, uh, can we start the recording? You are good to go. Thank you. So tonight um, for the uh, first week of CPAC summer school, I'm going to speak about the role of a CPAC. Um, CPAC is the Special Education Parent Advisory Council. Um, a lot of groups call themselves a CPAC, um, it used to be SPEDPAC, um, but a lot of groups have different names. So um, it's all local control in Massachusetts. Um, a parent group that advises the school district on special education can call themselves anything they want, but the formal um, title is that you're a special education parent advisory council. And that word parent is so important because it should be parent driven, parents um, providing that input and not a, a, a vehicle or a tool of the district. It's something that you provide advice to the district. So tonight it's the role of the CPAC. And why are CPAC so important? Um, they're really uh, an advisory group um, to provide direct input to all of the school leaders about you know, what's working and what's not working. They can advise the district about the policies that come out of the school committee, um, the different programs that are offered for students, what are some of the practices, especially around uh, discipline or uh, other things that might adversely affect students with disabilities, um, and all the different services that are offered. Uh, it's really to make a better system. Uh, it's feedback, it's a feedback loop, and it's a, a formal role. Uh, in fact, the um, state ha in Massachusetts has recognized that CPACs are a public body, and so therefore they have a formal seat at the table, and therefore, therefore they have a place to be um, sitting in front of the school committee on a formal uh, uh, matter and, and bringing reports and information and um, anecdotal, anecdotal stories to the school superintendent, the special administrator and the school committee on all of the matters um, around special education. Their purpose is really to advise and advocate for families in, in, um, in a systemic way, not individual families. And they offer guidance and maybe some suggestions, but they don't decide policy. That's the role of the school committee. So I mentioned earlier that CPACs are not required under the federal law, under the Individuals with Disability Education Act. Um, it's a Massachusetts state requirement. And that it's very, um, you know, Massachusetts allows local control of a lot of the educational practices. And in this case, they also allow each CPAC to set their own operational procedures, which are bylaws. Um, and so that's why every CPAC in the state um, operates a little bit differently. So we can't really say this is the way to do it. Um, it's kind of what fits in that district. And that's why it's, it's a dynamic thing. And, and also um, different groups of leaders of the CPACs can change the bylaws um, as things change in the world. Um, we know that recently is now CPACs are holding virtual meetings and that's been a change that's been allowed by um, the um, Attorney General's office for all public bodies. So they're different things and they should be flexible enough to adjust to changing times. And I mentioned again, it's a parent advisory council. Um, you can have members um, from different um, um, elements from your community. In fact, having community involvement in your CPAC is a really good idea, um, but it's really should be driven by the parents because they're the ones who are most impacted by the decisions that are made by schools. Um, you can have such a positive impact. Uh, and that's what I hope that um, the tone of the guidance here uh, from MassPAC is that you're such an important voice is to raise the level of professionalism of CPAC so that they're seen as that trusted resource uh, for the school district and help them with their decision making. So the law is very specific about um, what the CPAC duties um, shall include, but they're not limited to these things. But I'm just gonna go through the three main things that the CPAC um, should be doing on a regular basis. Um, we talked about advising the school committee on matters that pertain to the education and also the safety of students with disabilities. And you know, this is such a, a key time when we're looking at um, health concerns around um, you know, the 
pandemic and the virus and how important it is that schools are hearing from families of students with disabilities around their concerns around safety in schools. The CPAC should be meeting regularly with school officials and each school district will do this differently. Um, you might meet with the special ed administrator, you might meet with um, a liaison from the school um, committee or maybe even the superintendent or a leadership team. Uh, every school district's different, but that regularness um, really should be in there and that that's not twice a year. I think it needs to be a little bit more formal so that the school is getting regular updates. Um, and it, it could be through reports or other types of vehicles, but um, you know the meeting regularly with school officials is important because it, it's that dialogue. It's what engagement's all about, regular two-way communication going back and forth so that they're advising you of updates and you're advising them of concerns. Um, it's a nice vehicle to share information and, and to communicate to the community. Um, and here's the piece that I think we need to really work on for CPACs is how can they participate in the planning, development, and evaluation of special education programs. Um, often they might be invited to um, a hiring committee or if the school is doing some kind of evaluation, but where are they in the planning part? Um, where are they in um, you know, development of programming? And getting that feedback. And so that's something that, you know, I think a CPAC has to be pretty upfront with when they start meeting with school officials is what are the ways in which the CPAC members or one of the CPAC members can participate on some of these um, development boards and helping to evaluate special education programs, having more of a formal role that way. The law also has um, a, a piece, not, not only in the law, but in the regulations, that um, there should be an annual workshop for families um, on their rights under state and federal special education laws. Um, but what's interesting, if you look at the law and read it carefully, it's really the school district's obligation to conduct that in cooperation. Um, they ask the CPACs to cooperate with that. And so that's something that, you know, really the school district is obligated to let families know, just the way they have child find, they have to find families and find students with special needs. They also should be letting those families know what their rights are. Um, and the Federation has a basic rights and special education series. We've um, amended it last year. I, th I think it's pretty successful. We have um, three options for school districts and CPACs to um, uh, get a, a basic rights workshop under the MassPAC Plus membership. It's uh, evaluation and eligibility. It's understanding the IEP. And there are, I think, over 60 school districts that are just high school age students, um, nine to 12. And so we have introduction um, to transition planning as one of the basic rights, because when students get to age 14, basic rights is all about transition planning. So that's, um, something that's embedded in the law um, and that should happen every year. Does it happen in every district? No. <laughs> so this is where we just need to really be, um, you know, I'm so glad there's so many people on this webinar because it's really spreading the message out to a wider base that this is something that school districts should be doing and CPACs can be driving that process of saying, hey, when is that workshop? And how can we help spread the word about it and get information out? Um, so that people can attend. Uh, and this year, they'll be virtual, so that hopefully we'll get a better attendance. So there are a lot of benefits when you have an effective CPAC, because it's really more than just a meeting. It's really a mindset on the set of the district that we value parent input. We want to have um, input as to what is um, working for our students and our families. Uh, it seems to me such a waste when you have a, a program that nobody likes and it's just not working and they just don't get that feedback. So um, for CPACs to be effective, we know that they can be such a great force um, to outreach to a lot of families, to bring those families in, to help those families understand their rights, to help the, 
the families understand systems. Um, you know, as a parent, um, you deal with the uh, issues around your child's disability and learning all of that. And then you go into school and you have to learn the whole IEP system. And then you have to understand how recreation works for your kid. And this and the healthcare system, there's so many systems. And the CPAC can be at the center of that to do outreach and bring those families in so that they get the information they need to be you know, decision makers in their, in their child's um, lives. All those positive relationships um, have benefits along the way. Um, by building relationships with schools, you're now becoming a trusted advisor um, and you can do some collaborative problem solving. Things are gonna go wrong. Um, you know, you're gonna have problems with buses. We know the school reentry is going to look difficult in the fall and how can the parent groups come forward and be part of those, that collaborative problem solving. Um, you having um, some you know, information, what does this language sound like? Um, we're right, we wrote this letter, can you review it? Does this sound family friendly? Um, there's so many times that people have the best um, intentions and they're not realizing that they're just not making it family friendly because they're involved too much in the system. Uh, this is something that I got involved in the CPAC with is I wanted change. I wanted to see improvement in certain areas. And so I said, here's the way I can, you know, get involved and do things. And that's what I think a role of the CPAC is if you're sitting on these um, boards that are deciding policies and decisions around which reading program to bring into the school district, that's so, so important you become that trusted source of information. Um, you have um, different channels of way of reaching families than that school does. And, and that's all good. Um, I'm so impressed with Facebook. I don't love it, but how quickly CPACs can share information and reach people in a platform that is you know, very accessible for a lot of people. And that information sharing is so important. When the school district has a challenge, it's great when they can go to the CPAC and say, can you help us get this information out? Can you get this to the places where we know we're not reaching? Um, not everybody responds to emails or, you know, now we don't even have papers going home. Um, so that we need to have different ways of sharing. Um, because ultimately, what are, we gonna, what are we gonna get out of all of this work that we're doing is improve services and programs for our kids, um, better outcomes for our children. And that, that's really what it's all about. Um, it's really about how can we improve the system so that our students do better. They have challenges, but how can we make things better? And that deepened trust um, between schools and families. Uh, it's what family engages me all about. It's what we're working towards. It's you know, coming together. And I think that's the silver lining in all of this, um, you know, pandemic and a quick uh, shift to schools being closed and remote learning is schools had to reach out to families. And so there's been dialogue happening and I'm hearing good things um, that, you know, families are all of a sudden seeing how education's really working for their child um, through these Zoom platforms. So that, you know, there's this, sense of communication and developing relationships with schools for better outcomes. So we talked about the three different um, pieces in the law, the roles and the duties of um, the CPAC. Um, number one was advising the district. Um, a lot of people don't know what an advisory group is. Um, there's a wonderful free curriculum that's online, the servingongroups.org. Uh, we'll touch base with it on another one of these um, weekly sessions. But in there, they speak to what's an advisory group versus other types of groups. Um, and their example of some of their actions is they would make recommendations. They're not gonna tell the school students, this is what you have to do is we would recommend. Um, they could also provide background or furnish pros and cons. Um, even listing appropriate questions around a decision, like uh, are we sure we've covered these um, issues so that we are meeting the needs of all of our families. So an advisory group is a different group. It's not a decision-making group. Um, and the, your school board or school committee is um, hopefully reviewing the information, but they're not obligated to follow that advice. I think it's very difficult for CPACs to um, sometimes sift out what some of those issues are. Um, they're not really 
geared to represent an individual family or an individual issue um, or act on behalf of a single child. That's not their role. They're looking at changes within the system, systemic issues. Um, but sometimes they have to ask specific questions. I remember working with a group once and we um, were saying, what are some of the issues? And a parent said, well, I'm having problems on the bus. And we put it on the chart and I didn't think it would rise up to the level. And within the group, all of a sudden everyone said, so do I, and this is my issue on the bus. And I'm my child is having that issue on the bus. And all of a sudden from, by putting it up there, by someone bringing it forward to the CPAC as a topic, it brought, other voices in the room up and we said wow maybe that is a, a systemic issue or a problem that we have within the, the district that we should do more work on and so that's an, an idea uh, uh, an example of one issue that could be an individual issue but it could also be a systemic issue so you need to look for stories and perspectives from parents. Um, a lot of CPACs do surveys. Um, they have focus groups. Um, they might have a, a, a place for people to send um, their concerns to because they want to start to collect stories and see if there's a pattern because they're looking for something that's larger than one family. Um, I always say to CPACs, your job is, is really not to help a family understand, you know, their IEP. That's the Federation's job. Have them call us. It's you're looking at systemic issues. Meeting regularly with school officials, I, I talked a little bit about this. It's going to look different in every school um, district. A lot of uh, superintendents have parent uh, leaders groups, and that's a great place for a CPAC to have a seat at the table um, to collaborate with all the, the fine arts parents and the elementary school um, you know, PTOs and PTAs um, to get really connected to the school system so that they're doing things in collaboration with the other parent groups. Um, and also inviting the school committee members to attend CPAC events. You know, that's another way to have regular connections to the people who are the decision makers. And I always think it's important that the CPACs submit some type of an annual report, either they um, submit in person or in writing to the school committee. And that's something we're gonna talk about a bit, little bit later in another session, um, how to do that annual reporting. And here's the thing that I thought was so important is to participate, um, you know, to be involved when they start uh, developing needs assessments and the questions, um, you know, um, how, what trainings are happening? Um, you know, what are, what's the professional development that's planned for next year? And, and has the CPAC had any impact, input into the process of, you know, what is the school, you know, spending money on and, and planning for the next year? Uh, that's all great opportunities for you to really make change across the system or to impact the system. Um, and you can do work and, you know, um, provide it back to the school district and be part of that monitoring process. So there's lots of ways to participate. It really depends on your school district, what they're doing and, and you know, trying to, to move it forward. Um, so that's really um, a way for CPACs to, to get involved. Um, all of these other activities um, are in addition and extras um, and it's outside of that um, uh, formal role. Uh, they're all very valuable. They're all help the CPAC uh, form um, information uh, to inform the school district, but they're not um, within the law. Um, and it's, it's, it's interesting because most people who um, are exposed to CPAC activities see all of these workshops and events um, and it's really not the primary role of a CPAC. So we know that we want the CPAC to turn ideas into action. Um, you wanna shape input that you get from families into those concrete issues and direct that information to the decision makers. You're looking for positive changes in policies, services, programs. The more you're structured in your operations um, to you know, get that input, to review that, um, helps you focus on what are the one or two, maybe even three critical things that you might focus on for that year. 
Um, you can't take on everything. You can't do it all in one year. So you really need to have a process um, and go through a formal process, get the input from your membership, and then move one or two critical issues forward um, and involve other stakeholders to make that um, really a, uh, a formal way of providing input to the school. I think it'll be received better than just coming in with complaints. Um, nobody wants to hear complaints, they wanna hear solutions. So if you come in with a challenge, um, a, an issue and some uh, suggestions for solutions and the, I think commitment to be part of the decision and the solution is, is another way that CPAC can be most, most effective. Um, and, and I just think, you know, you have to sort it out because you, not everything involves that um, CPAC um, action. So the last thing I'll just talk about is, um, you know, the role of MassPAC in all of this. Uh, it's a statewide organization. It provides assistance to the CPACs um, throughout the state. We do have a membership type of structure so that you can get more benefits by being a member. Um, it's been um, at the Federation for um, over probably it's 12 years now. <laughs> and we run an annual membership that coincides with the school district membership from July 1 through June 30th. Um, we're finalizing the package for this year because we've had to make a shift to some virtual training. So there'll be more information about that. Um, we have a page on our website, on the Federation's website, uh, MassPAC, so that you can always check out the latest uh, information there. And because this is summer school, I want to make sure you do some homework. Um, so I talked a little bit about the guidance document. So if you're brand new to CPACs and you know nothing about them, and tonight's your first intro, um, I suggest that you go online and go to the Department of Education and download this guidance document. It's available in several languages. It's 10 years old though. So I think it's pretty good, but there's some sections there that I think need updating. I'd love some feedback on that. Um, and I also sent everybody the law and the regulations so that you can read through those so you can see what is the CPAC really required to do under the law. Um, you'll note that there's no fundraising in there. You're not required to do fundraising. Um, and so I have so many questions on fundraising and, and issues around that and, and it's not your primary role uh, for the CPAC. Um, does having money help? <laughs> yes. Um, but uh, just to review some of the basics um, to get started. So that's the end of the first learning session. I'm always available to answer questions. Uh, right now, it's via email. I have two emails. Um, I follow them every day. Um, so you can email me um, at lleslie at fcsn.org or always the masspack at fcsn.org. Um, and I'm um, happy to answer questions, uh, especially if you don't feel comfortable answering them in a, in a public platform. Um, no problem, um, I will do that. So let's end the recording now and open up the questions and figure out how to do that. <laughs>